Well, welcome everybody. I'm Karen. I'm, I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session, Losing Women. Um, a report a report launch today is a really important day. Um, I'm going to give it another minute or so, or we'll just wait for any extras to come in, because we've literally just um, hit um, uh, 10 a.m. Um, we've already got about 90 people in the room. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, really excited. A few more people are joining us as we as we get going. Um, in a moment, we'll talk about kind of um, the normal, what do you call it, those things. This is going to be, you're going to hear this, what do you call it, a lot, because um, here we are talking about menopause, and I am a menopausal woman who can't remember her words. So so we're going to talk about housekeeping in a minute, just, um, just uh, as everybody comes in. Super, thank you very much. So housekeeping, making the most of our time together. Microphones on mute, if you can, say hello to each other in the chat box. Um, use that also as a means to ask questions, any technical issues. I've got some amazing colleagues on the call, uh, Rachel and Deb, who will help you out if you've got any technical problems. We are recording, so um, don't say the, I'm not going to say those words because I often do, but anybody who used to watch something back in the, the 90s will know what I was talking about. Um, uh, sessions are recorded, put on our website, tweet about the sessions, please, please do tweet about this. This, this, um, this research that we're going to share with you today is incredibly important for women in the NHS, women working in the NHS. So please, please do use Twitter today to tell people about what you hear over the next 90 minutes. Um, um, we are the Strategy Unit and the Midlands Decision Support Network who are running these, um, this event over these two weeks. We're into week two, and today I think is probably one of the most important sessions of the fortnight. So here we are, we've got about 94 people in the in the room um, and we're going to get going. So huge thank you to everybody who has come along today. Today is a special day um, and you, the audience, are going to be part of today. My amazing colleagues, Abby, Lisa and Justine, are launching this groundbreaking research into the impact of perimenopause and menopause, menopausal symptoms on women who work in the NHS. Um, the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause, they're well documented. We've got amazing clinicians out there, such as Dr. Louise Newsom, who's been sharing with people about this. She's been putting menopause up there on the map of, of discussion. And celebrities such as Davina McCall, who uh, are sharing their own experience of, of, of menopause. Um, but, what, but what the research doesn't always describe is the impact on women's lives. And so here today, that's main. That's what we're talking about: the impact on women, like women's lives, who work in the NHS, and then the impact of that on the NHS. Um, so that's today, and I'm going to introduce you to our panel. So first of all, um, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Abby Muller. Abby is our evaluation specialist here in the strategy unit. Uh, she is the brains, the inspiration, and also the energy behind this whole project. Um, as our, um, she's been with the strategy unit now for nearly nine years, and prior to this was a research fellow at the Clark. Um, having wrote the specification, so being the brains behind this in the first instance, writing the specification, she then went along and managed to convince our chief exec of Midlands and Lancashire CSU um, to fund it. And he did. And I've got to say a massive thank you to Derek for believing in this piece of work and being supportive of it. And that will it will become more clear um, as, I, as I go on. Um, um, so so she's put together this the most amazing all female team. You will see uh, it's a completely female team who have delivered this work. Um, and it's incredibly important research that I have absolutely no doubts or positive input impact. The, 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 the lives of women who work in the NHS as they themselves go through peri and the perimenopause and menopause. I want to just pause at the moment to share with you, the report's been embargoed um, and it's being released today in line with today's um, session. And I, for those of you that won't have seen the report yet, I just want to quote you something written by um, Derek uh, on receipt of this report. Derek Kitchen is the chief exec of Midlands and Lancashire CSU, and this was his response. When the rationale for research was explained to me, I realised that I realised the issues faced by women in relation to their employment would represent a challenge to the employers. 
What I did not contemplate, yes, as a male employer, was the impact that the menopausal symptoms have on women's careers and consequently the impact on their well-being in its widest sense. That speaks volumes to me, and I hope that there will be other senior uh, leaders of the NHS who are often men, who will also, from this research, recognise the impact that perimenopause and menopause are having on women in their workforce. Now I'm going to move on to introduce the rest of the team who supports Abby or worked with Abby, she'll tell me off for saying that. So it's always, it's always about the team with Abby. Uh, so we've got Lisa Cummins here, who is our lead health economist at the health, um, health Economics Unit, which is a sister unit of the strategy unit at Midlands and Lancashire CSU. And the amazing Justine Wiltshire, who is also our senior healthcare analyst at the strategy unit. We've got two panelists with us today. I'm really, really pleased to welcome. Um, Jackie McBurney, who when I met her the only the other week, described herself as a difficult woman. And I was jealous of that title, self-entitled self difficult woman. Um, so I'm, 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 you've inspired me, Jackie, to become another difficult woman. I quite like that. Um, but uh, Jackie is the founder and the chair of the NHS England Menopause Network. She's a registered nurse and works as a senior programme manager at NHS England. And last but absolutely not least, we've got Liz Miller. Liz is the Director of Nursing and Urgent Care here at Midlands and Lancashire at CSU. Again, another registered nurse whose history is around Director of Ops, Directors of Nursing, and prior to that, I thought most importantly, Matron uh, at UHB for Emergency and Acute Medicine. So uh, great experience. Um, we've got a great experience panel with us today. Um, we've just got under, because I've chopped for like 10 minutes now, um, just under 90 minutes together. Um, I, some, I know some of you, because meetings, etc., might have to dip out at 11 o'clock. That's fine. Don't worry. I'm just so pleased that you've joined us here today. Um, please quote, quote ugh, post any questions or reflections that you have in the chat box. And one of my colleagues, um, Rachel and Deb, remembered their names, only known them for many, many years. Um, they will pick up on those as we go through the session. Uh, we're going to do, we, we, we're going to just describe a little bit now about um, the methods that went into this research. But, but actually, the thing that we're going to focus on the most today is um, is actually the impact, the, the findings from the research. And we have to remember, these are the impact on people's lives from the menopause, managing symptoms at work, but also the impact on our clinical workforce as well. Those are the first three findings of that. So. Um, hello, we've still got people coming in. Oh, 102. Fantastic. Really excited by that. So hello, Abby. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, especially after that wonderful um, kind of big up to me. Um, but I have to say it is the it's, it is teamwork um, that's made this project uh, possible. And um, you're seeing Justine and Lisa, um, but there's a whole host of uh, women um, under behind the scenes. Um, but uh, and you'll see a picture of them on our report. Um, our report should be going live uh, relatively soon. If it's not already, I know there are people in the team who are working behind the scenes to do that. Um, so I want to give my personal thanks for the, the level of collaboration that's been involved in this project. Um, everyone who we went out to um, was um, uh, uh, just said yes straight away. And, and that's uh, those of us who work within the NHS and have been working within the NHS for a long time know that that's not always um, possible. So um, thank you uh, for everybody um, who took part in the, in the research um, and who gave their time in other ways as well. Uh, so thank you very much for that that um we have we do have a video um that's going to be released with this um piece of work um just to give a little bit of the background into why uh, we did this piece of work but again it is as as um, karen said it's entirely to do with um just recognizing that there's a problem and there were two things that led to that one as a service user of women's health services um i understood um that i was having a slightly different experience of navigating those health services um primarily because i could advocate for myself um, and I understood that I had that privilege so I wanted to and, and I realized that other women um, who are service users 
potentially don't have that. Um, so I wanted to see what we could do. And then when you go digging into these things, you realize that actually it's not, it's just, you know, uh, whether it's uh, cardio, uh, whether it's heart attacks, heart, heart disease, uh, whether it's um, pure women's uh, issues like endometriosis, women constantly have a poorer experience of health services um, than, their, uh, than, than men. Um, and I just thought I can't work in the area that I do, that I do and not do anything about it. So there was a little bit of pushing um, uh, uh, from that perspective. And then meeting like-minded um, people who also thought that I was of interest. When we came to concretizing some of the, uh, this, uh, looking at um, women's health particularly, we decided um, we wondered where where do we start because of course across the uh, women's uh, life journey there were a number of facets uh, of life that we could examine um, but there was a as Karen already uh, suggested there was quite some momentum around menopause so we thought let's start with that and then uh, thinking about it a little bit more deeper we thought actually the the NHS workforce is the right place to start and this was entirely to do with the as some of you will uh, be aware um, it ranges from you know the fifth or to the seventh, but it's in the top 10, the biggest employer of people um, in the world. Um, and when it comes to the NHS, it's, uh, it, it, you know, and uh, Justine will give you a little bit more detail, but it's, it's, it's about 76% of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the workforce is female. Um, and, you know, uh, we thought that it's going to be quite a lot of those at the menopausal age. Um, so that's why we thought let's start with the workforce and um, Justine will also explain that, um, you know, there's, we can get a level of data uh, from there. So that's why we decided to go with the women's, uh, with the um, NHS uh, uh, workforce itself. Um, so that's how we came to deciding um, the, to work within, uh, to, to specifically examine uh, the menopause in the, in the NHS workforce. Um, okay, so um in terms of methodology yeah sorry um so i'm going to talk about the quali uh, qualitative the qualitative case studies there's uh, six um team members of from the evaluation strategy units evaluate qualitative evaluation team um and um sanjay dugal um uh, dr sanjay dugal um kind of led on those pieces of work um but uh, there's two ellies um lydia um uh, sheila and maria who also worked on that um on those case studies so what we did we um uh, went out to six Midlands, uh, Midlands um, uh, 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 organisations, NHS organisations, three provider, three non-provider, and asked them, um, how would you like to be, uh, would you like to be involved in this? What that means is that we're going to come out to you, give you some recruitment materials, and we'd like uh, women who self-identify as having menopausal symptoms, um, to, uh, ask them to take part in this study. Um, and all six of the ones that we identified um, were happy to contribute to this piece of work. Um, so, um, so they sent out uh, recruitment materials and uh, uh, women who identified themselves as uh, being menopausal or having menopausal symptoms at work uh, got in touch with us directly with one of the uh, researchers and said, yes, please, can you, can I be interviewed? Um, and we just set those interviews up. And so what we report um, uh, is themes from those um, in our uh, uh, report um, and that we, we work those through with the findings um, that Justine and Lisa find from their economic and um, quantitative findings. Um, so that report as a case study, as case studies will be published separately in due course. Um, but at the moment, we just report on the overall themes that we find cross cutting Please. I'll hand it over to Justine to give a little bit of um, introduction into the, uh, the methodology of the quants. Thanks, Abby. Uh, so on the uh, quant side, um, we wanted uh, to get access to some workforce data, obviously, to sort of analyse the workforce. So we had the sort of current uh, workforce data broken down into, into various groups. Um, and then we also had information on uh, those who were leaving the NHS, not uh, changing roles within, within the NHS, just those that left the NHS, uh, and also those that joined the NHS. Uh, and we also had a fourth data set, which is around um, sick and leave. So our approach was to take all this data um, that we received and sort of analyse it and look at different things and, and see what kind of information was emerging. So that, that's kind of how we approached it from the, from the quant or the data side. So I hand over to Lisa. 
Thanks. Um, for the economic component, we're really interested in trying to estimate the cost, um, so the cost associated with um, kind of women experiencing menopausal symptoms and what impact that had on their um, participation in, in work. Um, and to do this, um, it was a bit of a challenge, really, just because there was a lack of data and, and a lack of evidence. But what we did, we used the same data that Justine used, the NHS workforce data. And then we also brought together some findings from the literature on um, experiences of men menopausal symptoms and the impact on the workforce. And then we kind of applied those estimates really just to generate um, the numbers and the costs that we did, which we'll go into in, in more detail in a while. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, oh, sorry, carry on. I'm, I'm sorry, it's my fault. I've menopausal as well. I completely forgot to say um, that the reason why we asked for this data was that we wanted to understand who these women were, sort of in this age group, what jobs did they have, what kind of salary bands were they on. We wanted to really understand who these, who these women were, but also we wanted to be able to make comparisons. So it's not just understanding this group, it's how do they compare to men of the same age? How do they compare to women uh, who, who are of a younger age? So that, that was also kind of part of our, our remit in the font work as well. Thank you, thank you, Justine. So. So thank you for giving us that oversight of the methodology that you applied. There's a lot more information, like we've said, on the website. Uh, we'll be posting a video there, uh, which will describe everything that the team did. Um, let's now get down to the findings, Abby. Um, so tell us, what did you find? So we can group our findings into three main uh, three main findings, and there's kind of subset of findings within that. We're going to talk across those they overlap. Um, so we're going to call. Uh, so I'm going to Lisa and Justine will have a little bit of a conversation around those. You'll find the detail of that, as I said, um, in the report that will be published. Uh, but this is a little bit more of a kind of a discursive um, aspect of it. So first of all, and it's it's a it's a little bit difficult to describe because it, it's some of it is quite heartbreaking because you 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 actually see um, in not just the the numbers um, and not just the cost but the real experiences and this is the the beauty of the way that we did it in terms of triangulated it across so the way that we worked I mean we've described our individual methodologies but we were constantly having discussions on, on a weekly you know twice weekly um, basis with all the other researchers about actually what does this mean and what is what's happening and also with our clinical advisors as well um, and then we brought it all together um, so the main the, the first finding is the the kind of the severity of the impact and um, the severity of the symptoms that the women experience and how they manage um, those uh, those aspects um, on a you know in, in their working lives um, and and a lot of the a lot of women described um, both physical. I think some uh, some of us will know there's both physical and psychological symptoms associated with the uh, with the menopause. In terms of um, uh, uh, physical, there's a lot around um, hot flushes, as we know, um, uh, uh, night sweats, um, but also cognitive ones as well, in, um, and and kind of brain fog, um, and that. Uh, uh, and memory loss. Those two were particularly the ones that affected women in their day-to-day -day, uh, jobs. Um, and the lack of sleep, sleep issues, disruption, tiredness, fatigue, that came into their job, but that was something that was, uh, that women described, um, you know, that happens outside of the workplace some, in, in, in most cases, but actually when they come to work, that, you know, uh, that shows up. Um, the good news is with some of the symptoms and as a kind of unintended consequence of the pandemic, lots of us lurched to work from home. Um, and with that working from home, there was a positivity. Lots of women said, ah, this works. And even people who normally wouldn't have worked from home were able to do meetings, were able to manage their admin task, and they said, you know, this has helped and I'd like to actually continue. So we know from the menopause guidance um, that was issued last week that there's going to be a lot more flexibility to NHS women um, in managing the symptoms. And that, as far, you know, from what we uh, saw in our data, that was very, that is going to be very positively received. But what I have to bring into, and, and, and Justine will give us some description, the characteristics of women um, who work in the NHS and are expected to have menopausal symptoms. What we could see from the qualitative data is that not all women have these options because of where they work, 
the kind of roles that they do. Um, so, so managing symptoms at work is almost a privilege that some of us enjoy. So just want to keep that in mind as Justine goes through the characteristics of the women um, who are experiencing menopausal symptoms. So thinking about the characteristics um, of women that are in this age group, um, we found that uh, across all age groups, women are around about three quarters of the NHS workforce, and it's slightly more um, of the primary care workforce, so close to 80% there. Um, <clears throat> we found that over half um, less, were on bands that were only less than 30,000, which is very different uh, to male colleagues uh, who were much uh, higher percentage uh, in, in the higher bands. Um, we found that a third were nurses, um, a further third were working roles as scientific or technical staff, um, and that actually, uh, in terms of organisation type, um, nearly 90% of all women in this age group were either at um, acute trusts um, or uh, mental health trusts. Um, we also found that around about three quarters of women in this group um, were white, so about a quarter uh, would identify as non-white. Uh, so it's just really understanding um, that group and that breakdown within the workforce. Lisa, would you be able to tell us a little bit around how, um, you know, uh, the, the different approach you took, I mean, um, in terms of doing the, uh, how many women are expected to have menopausal symptoms? So this is across the age group. Yeah, you can do. Um, so in Justine's analysis, um, using the workforce data, they estimated that around 16%, um, uh, wait, no, okay. in, in mind, it was 16% of women are of menopausal age, and then who may also be going through the menopause in a given year. Um, so that basically takes account of the number of women who are aged 45 to 54 um, employed within the NHS. And um, from that number, basically, we counted for those who may have gone through early or, prem early or premature menopause, or medical menopause due to medical reasons. Um, so that estimated that around 16% in a given year could be going through um, the menopause. Um, and by menopause, it could be perimenopause or postmenopausal as well. Um, and then in terms of um, those who may be experiencing menopausal symptoms that are severe, um, we estimated that around um, one in 10 women then employed within the NHS may be experiencing um, at least one severe menopausal symptom. And that was estimated using, um, again, the workforce data, um, but we applied the estimate of the um, proportion of women reported in the National Child Development Survey, a study, sorry, who were experiencing at least one severe menopausal symptom at age 50. So that's how we calculated that. And I think it was quite a shocking statistic to me when we did the original analysis and we started looking at it. But actually women in this age group, 45 to, 45 to 54, they would all be menopausal at the same time. But actually they're a fifth of the NHS workforce. And I was actually surprised by that. I didn't expect it. They were really, this group is a really significant uh, factor in, in the NHS. Thanks, Justine. And, and now we're going to move on to kind of the, the second finding and um, the kind of second group of findings is actually, OK, given that those are the kind of characteristics um, and the symptoms of women experiencing uh, menopausal symptoms, what then happens. So how, you know, how does this fifth of the uh, uh, NHS uh, workforce deal with this and still you know, at some in, in some respects? continue to show up for work, um, continue to work. Um, from the qualitative findings, um, it was really, it, it was very interesting because some of the qualitative findings got to bits that the quants just can't get to because you can't follow individual women in the, in the data. You can't see what choices have led to those. Um, but one of the most surprising thing, uh, most surprising finding across all of this is that lots of women who are experiencing symptoms who cannot deal with them. Um, and, and a lot of them talked about imposter syndrome. A lot of them talked about 
um, losing their confidence, feeling like a poor version of their previous selves, just couldn't do the same task that they used to. We're quite, you know, we uh, as women can advocate, we're advocating for ourselves. We are able to say, sorry, my menopause brain, I can't remember this. We're able to say that. But lots of women are not sharing that information with their employers, with their team. It, it really does depend on what their team culture is like. Um, now, we know with some of the menopause guidance, you know, there's guidance along the teams for colleagues, for line managers to say, have the conversation. But there's a choice there that women are making that's dependent on their personal value of themselves, their, their, their work ethic, their, you know, privacy. Um, and actually, some are not always aware that actually they've started their menopausal symptoms. So women talked, I thought I had dementia. I thought I was going mad. You know, those things are being reported by um, these individuals. Some of them, some of the women that we interviewed were a bit further down their journey. They had their HRT or they had other forms of, or they'd come out on the other side and they said, oh, that was me then. I now know that I was menopausal and I was having some of my symptoms, but at the time I thought I was going mad. Um, so you don't, you don't, people, uh, women do not always share that information with their employer. They do not share that. In, they, they might never have shared that information about their um, periods. Um, so why would you now going on to menopause um, share that um, private information? So what happens then? What happens then when you're in that uh, area and you still carry on working? Um, some women, if they've got severe enough, um, might uh, leave the, their jobs. They might consider leaving. Some might take sickness absence. And we'll talk about all of this uh, shortly. Um, but what I found really surprising from the qualitative is a lot of women um, that we interviewed talked about demoting themselves. So that means that not that they're in post, they can't handle the responsibility of their post and they think I need an easier role. Um, so they took, uh, we have instances of women who have said they were 8C, got, went down to 8B uh, or 8, uh, 8, uh, yeah, uh, 8C to 8A, you know, those things that they were going at least two bands down um, in certain cases. So those, those things were happening as well. Um, and again, that's some of that um, is is an option. Is is that an option that's available to you? Um, so, and I'll hand over to Justine now to say what we saw in terms of some of the you know the leaving uh, rates and, and and joining the NHS. Yeah, so there is a few uh, different ways in the the quant data, uh, which Abby's already mentioned as a sort of an aggregate level. So we don't have have individuals as such. Um, so we looked at leavers and joiners. Um, we also looked at sickness to try and understand sort of women's experience. Uh, so I'll just briefly mention um, sickness. Um, so what we see in sickness is we took all females in the NHS workforce by the different age groups. Um, and we uh, saw that there was a clear sort of obvious trend that as age increased, sickness also increased. And then we took males in the NHS workforce in those same age groups. And we could see the same trend as men um, increased in age, so did their sickness level. But male sickness in every age group was substantially lower than female sickness. Um, it was around about, female sickness was around about a third to a half again uh, above male sickness levels. So then we wanted to focus just on the age group 45 to 54 to really sort of get into this and understand what was happening with sickness. Um, and um, here um, we did, obviously the structures of the groups are very different. They've got a very different distribution between males and females in these age in this age group between the, the job roles and uh, the salary bands. Um, so um, we, we wanted to sort of make a fair comparison. So we did a regression analysis, which adjusts for these different factors. And when we did that, um, we found that gender actually isn't a significant effect on sickness leave at all, even though female sickness is much higher. Uh, it's pay band um, and some organisation types that lead to higher sickness. So the lower the pay band, um, the, the more sickness that people are likely to take. So, and I think it comes through in the interviews as well, people aren't taking lots and lots of sick leave to cope with their menopause symptoms. And certainly our analysis does, does kind of confirm that. Um, so that was looking at those people that are in the workforce and perhaps might be struggling uh, and through sickness. Um, and then we looked at leavers and joiners. And that was very interesting. Um, so we found actually women 
uh, in the 54, uh, 45 to 58 age group. Um, they left at a pretty similar rate to men. It was just over 5%, and men was just very slightly lower. Um, but actually, people's well, women's reasons for leaving were very different. So women in this age group are much more likely to retire, um, which I think kind of shocked me because you wouldn't normally retire before you were 55. Uh, so it almost feels like perhaps rather than leaving and getting a different job, actually you're just kind of giving up and it's that, that, that sort of crisis of confidence that we saw in the call interviews. Um, and so, yeah, just this real difference for women, but you have to dig a little bit deeper. The, the, the sort of headline figures you can take as one message, but actually when you go a bit, di bit different, a bit deeper, it's quite a different message underneath it. Um, Lisa, if I can just have you, you know, as you started building your economic model, um, what were the findings in, in, with some of this uh, in terms of sickness and leaving um, that you found in your data? Yeah, so um, we estimate that around kind of one in 10 women who may be going through the menopause do actually end up leaving the workforce or may end up leaving the workforce, I'm prepared for my words. Um, and that equates to about 1% of the total NHS workforce. Um, and then in terms of those who stay around four and 10, um, who may be going through the menopause, may uh, choose to re remain in employment. Um, and of those, some do reduce their, their hours. So I guess in terms of the overall workforce, you're kind of looking at around 5% who decide to stay without reducing their hours, um, around 2% stay and reduce their hours, and around 1% um, leave. Um, but again, even in, in the literature, um, there has been evidence that um, ability to leave or reduce your hours does heavily depend on your economic situation, in particular your partner's economic situation as well. So again, it kind of comes down to whether or not you actually can. So I don't think there's a choice element for lots of women in this. Karen, can I just hand it back to you um, before we got in, get into the uh, finding that relates especially to the nursing workforce? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask Jackie and Liz. Um, I've been noticing, well, I've been looking at the chat first of all, and there's, and this is resonating with people. People are sharing their own personal experiences. Thank you very much to everybody who's done that um, about kind of like either not knowing um, or or it's impacting their thoughts about whether they should um, apply for other jobs. Um, people are reducing their hours. Uh, and Jackie and Liz, in your experience, um, in the roles that you do, um, does this surprise you? Is there something or, or is, is, is this just kind of you clocking this and going, yeah, yeah. Liz, take yeah, So, um, I mean, I, I know we're moving on to the clinical workforce, which of course hugely resonates with me and I'll, and I'll, and I'll park my nursing brain for a moment. But, but one of the things that's really resonating is, uh, you know, as an executive director of nursing, I, I interact with lots and lots of other very senior women. And I've seen women's careers really falter as they go up the ladder because they have this incredible loss of, um confidence or the very thing that's got them to their their powerful position their cool demeanors their their you know their their the the way that they project themselves in meetings etc tends to alter and it's all too easy and I, and I know we don't want this session to turn into a man-hating session and that's not what I'm getting to but the majority of, of executive positions within the NHS are predominantly white male. So they don't really understand what has the, you know, the factors that influence women going up through the ladder. But, but it's all too easy, I think, for, for women in powerful positions to get labelled as emotional, um, you know, anxious uh, as, they, as they start to experience some of these perimenopausal symptoms. And I think that is when it sort of further, you know, stops women from coming forward and, and, and getting into those, those levels of position, uh, you know, le positions of power. And I think the other thing that, you, something Abby said earlier that really, really resonated with me, it's often not until you come out the other side that you realise the impact of those symptoms on your, on your life. And it's really great to see all the, the, the sort of sharing of stories within the chat. 
because you know it really resonates within my own my own sort of um journey and uh, you know i was really really lucky to have a a supportive gp but but you know lots and lots of women just don't get that level of support and, and interaction so a lot of what i'm saying is really resonating but this won't change none of these messages will change i'm sorry my dogs have just come into the room as well so that's that's that that growling that you can hear not not the men in my life going oh what you're talking about um but you know that that level of um of, of this this interaction this this con these conversations are so important because nothing will change unless we start to highlight the issues and the impact on women thank you thank you liz we I totally agree and, and unfortunately or for you know we've got 105 people on this call today very few men are amongst that 105 people so <clears throat> jackie i mean yes. chair of the nhs uh, menopause network yeah um Tell us how, how that might be resonating from what... I, I'm so, so pleased to be um, here today and agree with all of our speakers um, today and, and exactly what Liz has just said. I hear as chair on a daily basis, this is somebody's life. Um, and the, the genuine... Um, the generosity that colleagues are sharing their stories in the chat box is really empowering and really kind of powerful. And um, the report uniquely brings out the, the marries up between the data and the impact, but then, but then my lived experience is this. And that's what I think is really unique about this piece of work. Now we hear about imposter syndrome we hear about losing our words mid-sentence what we also need to remember is and we absolutely respect this we've had this conversation prior to today is that if our colleagues have cultural issues or don't identify as women we have even more sensitivities around reporting this, acknowledging this. So just to bring that a little bit wider, and I know that's something we did discuss, but for now, it's about all of that. And unless we take a system approach and use the leadership from today, we'll continue to look at this round a retention lens or a well-being lens, and it can't. We've got to do it differently. And I think this is a fantastic piece of work that makes that point really beautifully. I'll shut up now. Uh, Jackie, thank you. We've got to name it and we've got to and we've got to uh, understand it and it become part of our um, our working lexicon and our understanding. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Abby, please do carry on. Just to pick up on the point that Jackie was making, um, we were very conscious of all of this. And, and when we get when we look at the quantitative and the economic uh, data and the underpinning um, uh, 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 data to uh, to analyze, you know, at the moment, we're limited by how data is collected um, and part um, you know, both in ethnicity and gender. You know, gender is very binary um, and ethnicity, ethnicity is not detailed enough. We tried. We did attempt to tackle this in the qualitative to get the lived experience. Um, and what we um, we encouraged, um, and, and especially as Justine was doing her analysis, um, and as she mentioned, you know, one in uh, 25, uh, a quarter of the NHS uh, workforce, uh, and it does um, carry through um, within this age group. So menopausal age, uh, female age group um, is um, uh, is not is uh, is minority ethnic. We'll classify as men. We try, and given that, especially we, our case study was in the Midlands, we wanted to be representative of that. It was very hard to recruit, um, uh, and uh, you know, I I think when we go out, if others go out to do similar pieces of work or look at this uh, experience of menopause in the workplace. I would seriously encourage people to look at directly, and especially when we're going to nursing, clinical workforce, to look at women from uh, other, other ethnicities and their experiences, because part of what we I was describing earlier and whether you choose to share is also cultural. Um, do you share your menopausal experience? Do you are uh, aware what do what do your mothers and your grandmothers experience of menopause? How does that relate to how you perceive your um, experiences? So I think that needs to be talked about. And if and and I, I take the view, uh, uh, Liz, as well, that if women are um, if women uh, if senior leaders are not sharing. 
um, and um, their 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 experiences, then you will not get that cultural shift um, in other women, uh, other women coming forward. And uh, so I think uh, very much so. But if you move the conversation on to the third finding, and that, and especially, so this um, this is a, a particular group of um, of uh, um, employees, and this is the the nursing workforce. So nursing, midwives, health visitors, um, and Lisa will kind of. Uh, one of the reasons that we looked at this particular um, uh, uh, is because we have enough data um, to be able to populate the model. Um, so when Lisa tells you the, the cost um, uh, for this uh, for this group, it's entirely to do with having enough information available. Um, and Justine as well, we have that as a staff group. We can go and look at the data to kind of a look at what it, what's what's happening there in the qualitative. Um, we tried to get these women um, to participate. We we were successful to a certain extent, um, but not enough. Um, but of course, to participate in an hour's conversation, um, to talk about your menopausal experience is a luxury that most uh, of our colleagues uh, do not have. You know, the reason why we get managers, uh, you know, uh, over half of our um, participants were managers um, was is because they have the time, you know, they might be working from home. They've got the privacy to be able to have this conversation. So when we talk about, you know, what privileges we have, um, it, it, it kind of carries through in terms of how people participated. So, OK, so when it comes to um, the nursing workforce and just generally uh, the medical workforce as well. So nurses in particular talk talked about their, um, the issues with um, their uniforms, making their symptoms worse. And I think that has been picked up in menopause guidance. Um, and there is an understanding that we that the, the uniform has to change, the material has to change. And given how much sports technology has moved on, you know, you think that um, uh, women who are delivering a, a healthcare a service would be able to have a uniform that actually uh, allows for their, you know, the, the, this issue of keeping cool, um, you know, available to them. So there was lots of issues around, lots of um, experiences of a uh, uniform that people talked about. But the more surprising finding in terms of the clinical workforce um, is when they talked about access to toilets. Now, I had, did not go out thinking that we do this piece of work and we collect lots of information about how do I use the toilet? And when do I get access to a toilet? But we found quite a lot of accounts of, of that. Um, and there were twofold. One was those uh, who worked in community settings having access to a toilet that was not in the patient's home. Uh, for example, having community-based um, access to toilets. So there was that bit of it. But then there was also the women who might be working on a, a busy clinic. In a hot in their in their uh, in their um, in their uh, uh, hospital um, or whatever their place of work was, but yet because of their the, uh, one of the symptoms that people don't really talk about when it comes to periods is the uh, the. Uh, flooding aspect of it. So um, the unpredictability uh, and the, the he heaviness of their menstrual flow. Um, so as backups uh, and women cannot, when they're in busy clinics, cannot even find time to go to the, uh, the toilet to, um, you know, they think about how often they're going to hydrate themselves. Um, but when it comes to something like this, where it's unpredictable, how did they use the toilet? You know, how, do, were they having? So there was strategies, lots of strategies in place and a lots of it, it involved using period pants. So those type of things where we cut that actually what you're doing is you're compromising on your own personal hygiene, uh, you know, feminine hygiene, your own personal health, because you are so busy delivering care to patients. Um, so that was the really depressing thing that we found in terms of the qualitative findings. Um, just going to hand over to you in terms of what that meant in, um, uh, 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 for, with regards to um, the other choices they made in, in terms of sickness absence and, and presenteeism. Yeah, so um, we don't find um, any sort of significant increases in sickness absence uh, based on the type of roles that, that people have. And I think that kind of also comes through uh, in the interviews. Um, in terms of, of leaving rates, for example, um, it's very difficult for people in clinical sort of patient facing roles to work from home. Uh, so, and we did see that clearly in the data. So the leaving rates have dropped uh, between uh, 2018 and 2021, um, but they 
for some professions and some organisations. So staff in CCGs, actually their, their leaving rate reduced by over a quarter, so that, that's quite a drop. And that we assume is because of the pandemic and people being able to work at home and manage their symptoms. But obviously clinical staff, we don't see that same drop because they're not able um, to do their roles from home. Lisa, shall we move on to you in terms of what that means in terms of the cost for this uh, particular uh, staff group? Yeah, we can do. Um, in terms of the cost, again, just to, to know that there was a, this was definitely challenging to estimate, even though we have come up with a cost for, the, for this particular staff group, um, it's still not perfect, but it is based on the best available evidence and data that we do have at this time. And it can be updated as more information becomes available. So the cost that we've come up with um, is estimated between, to be between 89 million and 129 million pounds. And, and that cost relates to um, costs associated with women who stay in employment to reduce the hours. So that would be things like sick days lost, so absenteeism. Um, and then for those who leave the workforce, we've costed hiring costs. So that's kind of HR related costs of recruitment and stuff like that. Um, training costs as well. So training costs for recruiting um, for nurses, for example and also staff cover costs then for those who do take time off. Um, we also want, had hoped to try and come up with some costs related to presenteeism. So presenteeism would be um, defined as maybe uh, productivity loss or, or days loss due to women um, turning up at work but not necessarily being able to fulfil their roles because they are unwell. Um, but there just simply was no, no evidence really that we could do that to come up with some sort of plausible number. Um, so in terms of the kind of forecasts that we could estimate, absenteeism, so sick days lost came in at around 31 and a half million pounds. Hiring cost was around 4 million. Um, training cost was around 43 million. And then the staff cover cost was 36 million. And the hardest one really to estimate was those staff cover costs because there is very limited um, information out there on um, cover costs or uh, cover rates by bank and agency and also the salaries that they're paid as well. And this generally varies by trust or by organisational level. Um, and it, unless you were to go direct to every single trust in the country, I don't think you could. Um, you could... I think you'd need to do that to come up with a, a more kind of concrete figure. But we've used whatever information was available to us to come up with that. Um, just in terms, just one note, note on kind of sick days lost and recording of menopause related sickness. Um, we didn't actually use NHS workforce data on recorded, recorded on ESR for this one. And that's because it's very poorly recorded. So it's been, I think, 2019 or 2020 when that was added to ESR, but it's it's not very, it's not used often really, to be honest. So that's kind of one of the key things as well as to try and try and address that so that we have the actual data and we can, we can come up with these figures, um, more plausible figures, I guess, and more concrete ones, but around 116 million pounds in a given year is the cost that we've estimated overall, for the nursing health visitor and the midwife workforce. Really powerful um, stories there and numbers and data that you are providing us with Lisa, Justine and, and Abby. Um, Jackie, um, you've, you've been quite, um, you've been on the old chat, chatting to people. Um, um, does that, does that sound like what you've heard from, you know, um, from your um, the members of your network? Yeah, it absolutely does reflect comments that I receive. Um, the issues we have, that are, um, um, I, I think, kind of the, the report casts a light on, are that we, we're faced with varying levels of confidence in primary care. So if a member of staff tries to access their GP, they may or may not have numerous visits to get that support. 
And even then, they will have varied levels of knowledge that GB being updated or not, and varied levels of confidence. They will invariably have a discussion about only two of their hormones, testosterone not being discussed in the main. They may get told um, that, as a colleague reported to me only this month, at 52, tough it out. Um, sadly, that just reflects some of the kind of levels of interpretation. So that individual then come into work and we don't have menopause awareness as statin mandatory. It's varied levels of awareness and confidence then again. And managers may or not, for instance, see tiredness as a menopausal symptom. So it just isn't in the, the kind of conversation. But then also to question back, are we placing the emphasis in the wrong place? As somebody struggling with imposter syndrome, lack of confidence, brain fog, all of those other myriad of symptoms, is it my job to educate my manager and then deal with potentially a negative response in relation to that after I've been brave. So I'm just going to kind of vo vocalise that on behalf of some of the network members, but it's really, really is something that's come through in the network. Thank you for sharing that, Jackie. L Liz, what about your kind of like going back to your operational days? Yeah, I mean, this I I I just can't tell you. There's there's so many things for me that 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 emerge out of this report and just even just the conversation. So let's think about it. Women that are not sleeping, you're having you know re increased um, uh, uh, you know it it. Um, oh, look at me! I can't even get my words out. Um, so so they they have an interrupted night's sleep. They've got, you know, all of the symptoms happening overnight. They have to get up at, you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning to, to be, be on at work, on duty, bright eyed and bushy tailed and prepared to give care and empathy and give everything emotionally to their patients. Um, straight away, you can see that this isn't this isn't, you know, helping women. It's not set up for women. Um, and the second thing is, I just want to, to, to really reflect on some of the things that affect nurses predominantly. Nursing is becoming an increasingly technical profession. We've always had to calculate drug, you know, drug um, doses, but now we you know, calculate drug infusion rates, uh, ratios of medication. It's really complex. And the implication of making a mistake is huge so if the press make a mistake it's recycled to us as entertainment uh, you know it'll be all right on the night or or you know those those bloopers that are shown to us on gmtv the nurse makes a mistake or a doctor makes a mistake it has a huge impact on a patient's well-being and you know and, and and leads to harm or even death so nurses have that and doctors and we're talking about nurses but clinical workforces obviously doctors as well and you know thank god increasing numbers of doctors particularly in primary care are women um, we we live by our code of conduct you know we have we know that if you make a mistake it has an impact you'll get referred to the NMC I've seen nurses spiral into complete you know anxiety because they can't they just don't trust themselves anymore to to check drugs to check infusions and I've literally been followed around recess by nurses going just check this with me again I'm just really not sure check it with me again and delays to patient care that come about and and just the and I know we work in, in a, you know, a really pressurised area, but I have seen intolerance that then comes back, you know, to, for God's sake, just get it put up. And then the nurse is left with this, this, you know, residual anxiety from just every day to day interaction around patient care. And I think, you know, it, it's only when you're in it yourself or you're reflecting on it that you start to see those interactions and the implications of those interactions. And so, you know, we are a predominantly female workforce um, and, you know, unless we really start to try and address these issues and address the, the you know, the impact of menopausal symptoms on the 
not the workforce necessarily, although that's massive, but on the work and the outputs of nurses, then actually we'll, we might start to have a different conversation because, you know, we've tried, the, the governance culture has changed a lot of other things. For example, you know, spinal syringes, you know, th those are the sorts of things that practical impacts have made because of an output, but, but you know, there's a, there's a, a, we need to change the conversation. We need to have a different conversation about menopause and menopausal symptoms. Oh, thank you, Liz and Jackie. Um, you're both right. We, we, we have to change that conversation. And I'm just looking at the, the, the meeting chat and people are describing the same thing. People are describing that being in a clinical position um, and on foggy head days are scared of missing things. And this is and if you can't talk about that, if you're constantly trying to manage that and mask that, um, that creates incredible um, anxiety for the person themselves. I can only imagine, let alone um, um, kind of their, their colleagues around them who are checking for them or looking out for them. Um, Jackie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, can I just add a, a comment on, on, on top of what Liz has just kind of really well described is, is the other aspect, of course, in a pressured system, we know that our colleagues are off, we're more likely to be covered filling in gaps. And whilst it's been a while since I've been in um, uh, um, an emergency department, um, I know even then, and I know from colleagues now, we're not getting breaks. We don't have that kind of decompress 20 minutes, have a cup of tea, have a slice of toast, have a wee. It's not, it's just not there. We, we, we're we not able to do that. And I know that um, um, in my kind of um, former clinical world, that was largely the expectation. But even in, in clinic world and, you know, the whole clinical world is just so pressured and it's not, it's not conducive if, if you just can't have that five minutes. So it's, it's really, really important that we do look at this in that clinical world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some people I know are going to see people hop off because it's the 11 o'clock moment. We, the rest of us will carry on. Um, and I'm just, I'm just looking at the chat. There's so much people are, are sharing here. Um, but also I'm just looking for questions that you might have. So Esther, Esther's asked the question, did the research highlight any of the implications of the recent and ongoing lack of treatment uh, and the impact of starting and stopping, of stopping treatment? I can take that one. Um, so we did a uh, look at treatment options um, because what we were, we were, we our aim was much more specific in terms of the impact of having symptoms and managing your work. Um, we did ask the question in the qualitative um, interviews. Uh, we asked, you know, um, how are you managing? And and for some women that they talked about whether they uh, were on HRT, whether they were willing to be on HRT or other um, ways that they manage their own symptoms. Um, but of course, it does tie in um, with the conversation that we've been having. It took people to recognise that they had symptoms at that appropriate time, whether they sought help. And for those who had chosen to take HRT, it's whether they then um, were progressive enough to be able to get their their mojo back if they, you know, felt that they uh, they were themselves again. So yeah, so we didn't um, look at that specifically. It wasn't the the kind of the focus of our analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question, Esther. Um, somebody else has, um, Catherine Jepson's mentioned about this being related to health and safety risk uh, for clinical staff operating clinical equipment. Um, and it needs, so um, impact on the trust addressing menopause symptoms needs to be higher up on their agenda. Great point. Absolutely. And and um, uh, uh, the research would, would, would support that. Um, somebody's asked, just wondered whether you linked with an academic institution to support the research project? We didn't um, because as Karen said at the beginning, um, our um, managing director uh, agreed, our host organization agreed to fund the research. And so, um, but what we did do, we had clinical advisors and some of you uh, will know our clinical advisors. So uh, one was Louise Newson. Um, I think we will all recognize her to be the influential uh, person that she is in terms of um, being an expert in um, menopause and getting it onto a very national agenda. Um, 
Um, but the the other uh, a person who helped us, the other clinician who helped was uh, is a GP based an academic an academic GP over at the University of Warwick. So Sarah Hillman, and some of you will also know her from her um, uh, TED uh, NHS talk, um, where she talked about medical feminism, and which you know I saw that talk a few years ago, and I just thought, ah, this is a, a person I need to work with. So we got in touch, and uh, and she's been really um, helpful um, in in advising us with this project. And just to say, Abby, people might not um, know much about the strategy unit. Uh, we do have um, a significant evaluation team, which you are a part of. So uh, we're um, uh, incredibly, um, with our analytical teams and the health economics unit as well, uh, we are well placed to do research like this. We are um, experienced and have the credentials uh, so that we didn't have to go to an academic institution. I think that's really important uh, to share that with people who might not know much about the team. And just to add to that bit, I think um, Karen uh, uh, said it at the beginning, but it was really important that within this project, um, we had a kind of an all-female team and we do have those skills within the team um, to be able to do all of this. Analysis. And especially in the fields that uh, Justine and Lisa represent, it tends to be very male heavy. So I wanted to uh, showcase that we have these skills within the NHS, within our teams. Um, and, and of course, there's an element of lived experience. So when we are discussing this work, it is our lives that we are discussing. It is our experience, whether it's now or it's going to be in the future. And that was important to have that, uh, you know, as the context within which we uh, did this work. Thank you, Abby. And Sonia, Sonia asks, did you get any men to participate in the study? As she knew some male colleagues said they were going to get involved. Yes, so again, uh, for the qualitative study, so Justine said for the quant, you know, you have the data, so she was able to do some of those comparisons. Uh, for the qualitative study, we did want those, that uh, that counterpart. So we did want to say, okay, what is the women, uh, men's experience like? We especially wanted to explore what choices, what career choices are making are men making at this age um, compared to women of the uh, uh, menopausal age. And just to say there was a chat uh, there was a question earlier on in the chat about someone saying why did you look at this age group unfortunately because of the uh, the way that the data is structured and because we know that majority of women experience it, um, menopause um, at, between the ages of 45 and 54 um, we had to go with that for the quants for the as Lisa said she did expand her um, her, her kind of data set to include those who will be postmenopausal and uh, early menopause as well and in the qualitative we didn't ask for any age group we just said if you're having menopausal symptoms and you'd like to participate of the women just come along so we had a, a bit of a range in terms of our age group um so for the for the men um we asked if they're in this age group um uh, would you like to be interviewed we had hoped that out of the uh, each of our case six case study sites there'd be three men who took part we got overall we had five men who participated so we haven't really looked at that data interrogated it because it just wasn't enough um so yes it's it's the same that we find uh, you know in our kind of uh, uh people who turned up for this uh, session and so Yes, it, that that worries me. That does because we 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 need we need that male engagement in this subject. We need men to to be engaged. And you know, another quick look through the the list on the chat of who sorry other participants. And there's probably five to ten men. Half of them work for the strategy unit. So thank you very much, strategy unit um, colleagues who uh, male colleagues who've joined us today. But but that's in the minority. And I don't know if anybody's got any ideas um, about how we um, engage men in this subject matter. Jackie or Liz? I, I can... Yeah, oh, go on, sorry, Jackie, go oh, ahead. Sorry, Liz. Um, I, I, I was re um, approached by a colleague, um, a male colleague who had a female partner and, and he wanted advice on how to raise this and what words to use because his female partner was up several times in the night, sometimes because of night sweats, sometimes just because of insomnia, because it was, um, and wanted to safely raise the topic um, with her. So um, just wanted advice and um, how to do that. And then as we chatted through, um, 
he himself made the connection with, ah, and I work with 90% women. So it was a little bit about, you know, gently teasing that out to the broader um, aspects as well. And, and certainly it has been um, for my regional director, he also um, had a chat with me and looked across the room when we were in meetings and said, actually, I have a responsibility here to call it as it is. So um, it is getting there, but it's difficult, um, I think, slow and steady. Absolutely. Yeah. And comments, comments in the chat box are suggesting that, you know, awareness training is hard to get men to attend. But actually, if you're in a line management role, we should making this be making this mandatory. Um, Liz. I, I was just going to reiterate what Jackie was saying, really, about making the connections with the women in their lives, be them their sisters, partners, you know, daughters, wives, wh wh whatever it is. You know, we we know the, this this report highlights that the you know majority of women will experience symptoms as they get you, into the, that age group. And from my point of view. You know, I'm, I'm married to another nurse. My, my husband's a nurse and he, um, you know, we, we talk about our symptoms and, and, and all, even just saying night sweats, it just makes it sound really trivial. It wasn't trivial for me. I had to get up every night and change the bed sheets because otherwise I thought I'd been incontinent. It was that, it was that bad. It was, you know, what, a, a small symptom, you, you vocalise a symptom and actually it doesn't do justice to the lived experience of that symptom. And unless we that other men who whose wives or, or the, the women in their lives are going through that experience has a have a responsibility as well because you know it's it's not a, it's not a small issue it's a it's a driving force particularly in the area that we work in and it's not going to go away it's never going to go away and and I was just reflecting on something I said earlier that I was lucky enough to have a supportive GP that's a terrible indictment isn't it this is a real and present health issue and we shouldn't be lucky to have a GP that I, I mean I, I'm, I'm really lucky my GP she's fantastic with everything but you know, my I was I was managed really well because I had a GP who was interested, engaged and willing to to work with me um, to find out what was best for me. So but this is a is it's not a social issue. It's a health issue that's impacting on our ability to fulfill our daily, uh, you know, our, our activities of daily living. Look at that for an old nursing uh, <laughs> throwback. But you know, you know what I mean? It's it's a it's a huge um, issue that needs to be considered as a health issue rather than as just as a as a um, you know a, a well being issue, which I think somebody touched on earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So mandatory training has been mentioned a number of times. Thank you to everybody who's who suggested that. And um, and and Esther's Esther's good comment here. Amazing how many women are not aware. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I know I was very unaware as a as a younger woman. I know I'm a different generation to those growing up now. Um, but but um, um, absolutely, how do we improve people's awareness in the workplace? Um, because you you could be you know anybody could be managing somebody who's having menopausal symptoms and um, and struggling even to recognise it themselves. Um, um, let alone um, getting support from you as a line manager, whoever you are. Um, and um, and somebody talked about it being strategic. So I think it was um, uh, Alison here um, working with senior leaders on a high on higher degree apprenticeships. You can see a role for embedding this in it into the learning at level seven. So really, really kind of making this kind of that's going beyond um, um, kind of. Uh, workforce you know in, in our normal uh, everyday lives so it becomes a strategic NHS um, uh, priority as well so thank you very much for, for that Alison. Um, Abby is there anything you out of your research um, oh sorry Jackie you've got your hand up Jackie just before I, before I move us on. Sorry Karen <laughs> I was I was just going mm. to follow on from your point there about this research um, being an opportunity to almost send out a call to action on, on those points that we've just gone through. Some of this we can't directly influence, but we can start the conversations to promote other things. Um, and we've, we've, we've shared various points about staten mandatory training, around breaks, around flexibilities and work, workplace culture. 
But one of the things we also know is, is that, um, that, that the report uh, sort of underlined is our gaps in terms of our experience walking through the door um, and losing that um, organisational memory and experience that's really rich and valuable. And it, we know that menopause isn't going to fix all of that retention and well-being issues and, you know, and fix everything. But it's one small thing we can do that crosses all of the protected characteristics, all of the networks we have in our workplaces, all of the religious, religious cultural aspects. And as long as we employ women, almost 80% of our workforce will be affected. So it's one thing we can say, if we want to recruit somebody as opposed to the organization down the road, let's make this something that we see and we say to our staff, we see you, it's our USP. Um, and it doesn't take a lot to do that. Great, great, a great suggestion, especially that call to action. I really like that, Jackie, thank you. Um, Abby, is there anything else from your research that you want to share with people before um, we we kind of I ask people we're going to do a little we're going to do a little breakout room where you can all have a chat with each other um, just for five minutes. But but Abby, before we go into that, is there anything else that you'd like to um, um, to share? And just to say that we have got a full um, a full set of recommendations in the report at the end of the report, and and we'll be it picks up on some of the things that we've been discussing and it is actually a call to action in, in a certain way and um, acknowledging that we as individuals don't have the power but in a, in, a, in a sense we have the combined power and it's only when we start we all start kind of pushing at the boundaries and um, that maybe you know we can get into some collective action that makes that change and so it's the position that in individuals have within their own um, uh, within their own remit to 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 change things. So I think I, I echo Jack, Jackie's kind of call to action, and let's see what we can all do. Um, just and I, I guess it's also making that point, extending that point as the responsibility of us as not just another employer, but actually the biggest employer of women, um, and also the aspect that we are a health and care provider. Um, so we have certain responsibilities uh, as an as a as as a, as an as the NHS that maybe others don't have, and maybe we can lead the way so that our findings um, are generalised to others because when we started this work and we looked at the workforce data um, regarding menopause you know the, the only things that we could find is more work needs to be done more research needs to be done we need to have you know so we've tried to fill in some gaps but you know there's there's still quite a lot to do um, so I think that's just it is, is the responsibility that we have as health and care uh, professionals working for our healthcare provider. Thank you, Abby. Um, absolutely. Each and every one of us has a role to play in this. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to put you into breakout rooms um, um, and we're going to put you in groups of four or five, small groups. Just have a chat about what you've heard today. You've just got five minutes and we've got two questions for you. What resonates? And what's the one action you can take away having heard the findings of this research? Um, just and we're going to ask you to then put any any thoughts that you've got into the chat when you come back to the room before we finish off. So so um, please um, enjoy that five minutes. Meet some people that you might not have met before um, and um, have a think about those two questions. What resonates? What's the one action you could do as a person here today, having heard what you've heard, to take away and do? Because if 90 of us take a small change away, that will make a huge difference. So my colleague Rachel's going to shift us into those um, breakout rooms and we'll just come back in five minutes time. Um, I hope you all got to enjoy that chat with each other and making connections with people that uh, you've probably never met before. Um, and I just wondered if people have got anything they want to share. If you're feeling brave, do put your hand up on the screen um, or put it into the um, into the chat. Anything come out of your discussion? Anybody make any uh, commitments? to each other. Spreading awareness, promoting this session. Thank you very much, Liz. That's absolutely fantastic to hear that you'll be doing that. Has anybody else got anything they want to share from that discussion? I think we were saying, I was talking to, um, where have you gone? Um, 
They might have left. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Sorry, that's not because it's, it's not that's not brain fog. That's like I can't remember. Um, is it apta? Um, we we were saying that this uh, Liz, you picked this up. This experience of um, you know the the, the higher you get in terms of the you know seniority the gender the glass ceiling you know the kind of difficulty with getting in the first place there's a sort of clapping and a woohoo that person's dropped off we haven't got to worry about them anymore you know the we've got to be really careful this is why we need to be strategic and we need policy and it's got to move beyond the lived experience because any any um opportunity to minimize the experiences the impact is taken with with a vengeance and and i think um you know we we were talking about um uh, the already difficult uh, gender inequalities that we see in lots of different industries you, you're talking about the nhs i've just come out of 10 years in academia and abby i don't know whether you remember uh have you noticed do you remember where we met <laughs> h is it uh, hsmc were you at hsmc yeah, yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> back in the, Hello. Back in the. My menopause brain. I, I, <laughs> That's I'm all right. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. But I think it, yeah, it's this layering. What you found is the is 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 great because it's a scope and scale study, um, which is needed to support what we already know in terms of the lived experience. But um, oh, thank you, Alison. But I, yeah, I hope you you know push 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 and and embed and. Yeah, if there's anything I can do to help, I'd be really happy. I've, I've left. I was in a senior position. I left. I didn't realise my symptoms were. I'm now working for myself and I love it. And uh, my my own boss, which is me, now says, oh, having a bad day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what we do now. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic news, Alison. Thank you very much for sharing. And great that you've got to that welcome. space. We've got Thank two you. hands up. One was, um, oh, they put their hands. Oh, 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 where are you all? Where are I've got the hands. Why can't I see the hands up now? Hey, Hazel. Hazel, yeah, Hazel first. Hello, um, Hello Hazel. I'm uh, Hazel Baxter, Head of Medicines Optimization at Derby and Derbyshire ICB. Um, we've had a policy about um, on our intranet and there's also been some training put on menopause for the non-menopausal. Love the heading of that. Thank you for sharing that earlier on. Um, but... I haven't been on the training and I'm very aware that I now manage a team of 11. Some are men, some are will be menopausal women. Um, and actually, I need to do a lot more to raise this um, agenda. And I think the report coming out is, is a hook to hang it on. And so, you know, I'm going to go on the training. I'm going to ask if it's mandatory and we were talking actually you need a refresher the same as other mandatory training um and then take this report both to my team the wider team the senior team and actually it needs to go to the board as well because the huge implications that you know you've you've already discussed about losing this talent is is quite frightening really and they it should be on risk registers you know the it's that sort of level isn't it so it is. yeah, thank you oh hazel that is fantastic ellen you've got two minutes yes so my comment is very brief uh, it's about i've i've become kind of an, an advocate for menopause so i talk to friends i talk to people at work and what i find is that the level of experience that every woman experiences is so different and they go to talk to the gp some of them are quite humiliated actually about how they asked why are you asking for this so it's more about can this report be actually instead not only is being published but also be shared with the gp practice further advocate with gp practice so that people actually read it and take that mixed concept that the reason why someone is asking for help on menopause is not because they watch don't tell it, it's because they really are struggling with symptoms and they need help. So it's really pushed that through to GP practices to really make people read it and appreciate that it is a real problem that affects so many wonderful women. Thank you for that. That's that's a really, really great um, moment to to stop, to pause on and, and to say an incredible thank you to everybody who's joined us, uh, to our uh, panellists, Liz and Jackie, 
um, you've brought to life what we've discussed today, and then to Justine, Abby, and um, and Lisa, who are who are the tip of the of the of the um, the, the team um, who you represent here today. For um, thank you, a huge thank you from all of us for this amazing work that you've done. Um, and uh, and I'm just going to say also thank you to Derek for funding it. So before I finish, I can tell you this is the last week of um, Insights 20 or Insight 2022. So we've got some really exciting um, other sessions on that some of you might want to, to uh, join. Um, how do you know if you've made a decision? Uh, the new health and care system, what does better decision making like, look like? And I'm just going to plug day eight, Sarah Jane Marsh, insights from decision making practice because I am the fantastic facilitator of that session and I am so looking forward to um, chatting with Sarah Jane. She's going into a, a new job, uh, a national job, and uh, her insights into decision making practice will be absolutely critical for, for us all uh, to learn um, from her going forwards. So with that, say thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your week. Goodbye everybody. <laughs>